At its simplest, weed management just comes down to the three R's. We need to remove existing weeds, reduce pressure from incoming weed sources, and reclaim any bare ground in our garden as soon as possible. Now when you're dealing with pathways or border areas like this, weed management can be made extremely simple. Just cover the soil and you win. Weed management in our garden beds becomes a bit more complicated, but with some intentional efforts in the right areas and at the right times, you can set yourself up to win the war on weeds every season and keep your labor to a minimum. Since I know weed management can be a major barrier for new gardeners or anyone trying to scale up their vegetable production at home, we're going to take some time in this video to walk through eight specific strategies that we're using on this plot to apply our three R's of weed management and help our vegetable crops get established at the same time. Strategy number one is to remove weeds by hand. What, you say, Jared, I clicked on this video because I want to learn how to not weed by hand. I know, that's why I put this first, because it's the most important. If you refuse to ever step outside into your garden and remove weeds by hand, you will be doomed. At some point, you're going to need to take a stand and assert your dominance over the weeds. The trick is to keep this labor to a minimum. Today, I'm confident in managing plots of 1,500 square feet and larger with 10 minutes of weeding time per week or less. And one of the keys is that I'm out here on a regular basis, just skimming the surface and taking out any of those smaller weeds immediately before they have a chance to get established. If I do this task frequently, it's incredibly quick and effective at removing any of the smaller weeds that might have germinated in the last week. A quick slice of the surface is all we need to take them out. And a tool like this stirrup hoe is a great fit for that purpose. But occasionally a weed will slip through my grass and get larger. And at that point, I really need to make sure that I remove the weed before it goes to seed. I noticed some examples here among our oat patch. Here's a weed that blends in with our oats really nicely, but it's clearly another species. This plant is going to mature and go to seed long before I need to harvest my oats. So if I allow it to exist here, it's gonna drop those seeds in these beds. And next year, my weed management in these two beds is gonna be many times worse than this season. So at all costs, I must stop any weed that's going to seed, even if it means removing it by hand. And if the weed that you're battling has a deep taproot, or if it spreads by rhizomes, we need to make sure that we dig out the entire root system in that first opportunity, so we never have to come back and pull that weed out again. So occasionally I'll take a walk through our garden with a narrow shovel like this as well, and be sure to remove the deep roots of any larger established weeds that might have snuck by me. Now the nice thing about manual weeding is that it always works, but consider it a last resort. When you scale up your vegetable production to plots like this or larger, you have to work smarter, not harder. And the next seven strategies I share will help you stay on top of your weeds and keep your labor to a minimum. Strategy number two is to prepare the soil in your beds without tilling. Assume that the soil in your garden contains an endless bank of weed seeds that you may have to deal with. The good news is the only weed seeds that threaten your weed-free garden are the ones located in the top two inches of your garden soil. So this is the volume of soil that we need to defend and master in order to start with a weed-free garden bed. If we till the soil deeply, we immediately erase any gains we've made to eliminate the weed pressure from our surface of the soil because we bring new weed seeds up to cause problems. That's why our standard bed preparation routine avoids tilling by using a broad fork to loosen the soil deeply and then topping the surface with weed-free finished compost. That compost starts us off with a thin buffer layer between the bank of weeds below and the ideal growing conditions above where we'll plant our vegetable crops. If we continue this practice of bed preparation without tilling and defend the top two inches of soil in our beds from the onslaught of weed seeds in our environment, we can continue to reduce the weed pressure in our garden year after year. Strategy number three is to switch to drip irrigation. If I irrigate my entire garden space by spewing water into the air with an overhead sprinkler, everything gets wet every time I water my garden. So I'm constantly encouraging the germination of weeds and that means I'm fighting an uphill battle all season long. But if I use drip irrigation and deliberately distribute water in line with my plants, whether it's peas, squash, corn, beans, onions, I'm avoiding adding water to my pathways. So there's far less weed pressure in this zone and I'm using water a lot more efficiently to apply it right where my plants are. Now on the surface, it doesn't look like drip irrigation is doing a lot for you because it's just dropping one 
water drop at a time. That's part of the beauty of it. Only a portion of my bed surface will get totally saturated with water, but underground, that water is wicking to the sides. So the root zone underground still has great access to moisture throughout this entire bed. And because I'm not applying water over the entire surface, I'm slowing the germination of weeds, if not eliminating it altogether. Strategy number four is to start vegetable crops as transplants. When you are direct seeding a crop into a bed, you need to keep that soil moist for several days in a row to make sure you've got great germination for your vegetable crops. But what else germinates? Weeds, everywhere. So if we can skip that germination period and start our crops indoors, come out to the field with a three or four or five week old transplant, put it into the ground, we immediately gain the upper hand advantage for our vegetable crops because they're already established. We can water the beds deeply. We don't have to keep the top of the soil moist continuously and we get great leaf coverage over our bed surface within weeks. Cabbage is one great example where transplanting gives you dominance very quickly. Beets is another great example of a crop that transplants really well. And with the proper spacing, the leaves of your beets will quickly dominate the top of the bed as well, leaving nothing but darkness below for the weeds. Strategy number five is to top your beds with a thick layer of organic mulch. This strategy works best for crops that are planted at a low density, often with spacing that's just down the center of the bed. Potatoes are a great example, winter squash are a great example. What I see people do wrong with mulching is just applying a thin layer of mulch and calling it good. But this is really futile. You're really just preserving a bit of moisture in the soil. The weeds are still gonna pop through that mulch, no problem, and you're just gonna make it more suitable growing environment for those weeds. So if you're gonna use mulch at all, go in all the way, use six inches of mulch at least, and really smother out that weed pressure. These are no dig potatoes in front of me here, so this is a great application of mulch. We want the mulch to be thick to cover up those tubers underneath because they're just gonna be forming on the surface of the soil. So a couple of times during the season, I'm gonna come along here with a bin of straw, or mixed leaves and really pile it up. I would not recommend the use of straw if this wasn't my own straw because every time I've got straw from some other farmer it's come with tons of weed seeds. I've already used this straw in other places and it hasn't been germinating additional weeds for me so it's good to go. Since I threshed this wheat myself I know that all the wheat has been taken out carefully So it's simple, I'm sure you get the idea. I'll do that on both sides a couple times this season and our potatoes will be growing in darkness and there'll be plenty of moisture below and our weeds will be well suppressed. Now the downside of this strategy and the main reason why I don't use it everywhere is it obviously takes a lot of organic material that I have to acquire and distribute throughout my entire plot. And it's quite frankly annoying to have to be shuffling it off the bed, on the bed, depending on what type of crop I'm planting. Now that it's here, it's in the way for everything other than potatoes. If I wanted to direct seed carrots in this bed, I would have to be really diligent about moving all of this mulch to the side or somewhere else so that I had a clean seed bed again. So my preference, instead of using a bulky organic mulch in almost all cases, is to instead use a screened layer of compost to top all of our beds. That compost actually acts quite like a mulch and I can still seed directly into that as well. Mulch is also an ideal habitat for slugs. So if slugs happen to come in with your mulch or if they're already established in your garden, you've got a problem if you're just gonna keep topping up your beds with mulch. So the more I've played around with mulch in different scenarios in my garden plots, the more I've come to realize that its best place is really in the compost pile. It keeps things simple for me. And I just bring it out in situations like this when we're growing some no-dig potatoes. Strategy number six is to cover our bed surface with landscape fabric. This is a nice alternative to a bulky organic mulch because it can be moved around really easily. I've got pre-made standard size landscape fabric strips that match our garden dimensions. And anywhere I want to immediately cover, I can just roll out some landscape fabric. Drip lines can go underneath. We pin this down so it doesn't blow away. 
People always ask if moisture can penetrate these fabrics and yes, water can seep through. Although it's not great to pair these landscape fabrics with overhead irrigation because the water does tend to pool in the low spots or run off to the side. But it really is a great match for drip irrigation because you can put the drip tubes underneath. So that water is still applied everywhere throughout the bed. And then just let the landscape fabric work its magic by suppressing all of the weeds below. <clears throat> now that one simple act that took me seconds guarantees that I will not have to return to this spot for the rest of the season. Squash will have no competition. I'll spend no labor on this zone. It's a dream come true. And at the end of the season, I can easily roll this up and move it anywhere else. I don't have a bunch of bulky mulch to transport around with me or rake to the side if I want to direct seed in these beds next year. So this kind of application works really well if you've got plants transplanted all along the center of a bed. But what if you have your transplants uniformly spaced across the full width of a bed? For that, we can still work some magic by burning some holes at the desired spacing within the landscape fabric. When you use fire to melt holes in this fabric, the holes reseal themselves so they don't fray. And I've got some plywood templates that I use now to help me burn these holes with ideal spacing for various crops. This is corn, if it's not obvious. And we've got 60 corn plants in here, each transplanted into their own hole. All of these elm seeds that have been falling are drifting off to the side, or at least most of them. If any do fall into the holes, I at least know where they are and they're suppressed by the shade of the corn that's growing above them at a much faster rate. So we'll use a strategy like this for corn, onions, strawberries, brassicas on occasion as well. It's very effective in suppressing weeds while giving your vegetables a place to thrive in the same bed. Strategy number seven is to stop weed seeds with a tunnel. We often talk about tunnels for their strengths in season extension or pest protection, but this is an interesting application for them as well. In our unique situation here, we've covered onions, which have horrible ability to compete with weeds because their tops are so skinny. We've covered those onions with insect netting at a certain period of the year when we know millions of elm seeds are dropping from the sky. In our area, in mid to late May, this happens every season. So all these little white fluffs here elm seeds and thanks to this netted tunnel being installed over our onion crop in advance of that drop of elm seeds now all those seeds fell to the side i haven't touched these beds since early may like maybe gave them a quick weed before putting the tunnels on but let's see what's under here let's reveal them now the tops are getting too tall to contain anymore but thankfully we're into early june now and the drop of elm seeds is complete so many seeds did not land in this garden bed because of this netting. And it takes me again, like a minute to install this netting and remove it. So that's done. The onions don't seem to have suffered any negative consequences from this cover of netting. Their tops bent a little earlier than they might have otherwise, but I don't think that's a problem. They're still looking very perky. And if you come take a walk along these beds just to see the weeds that we find here, notice we've got, there's one, it's the lamb's quarters. Like, so that wasn't there when I covered the beds. That gives you an indication of how long these beds have been covered without being touched. In most garden plots, you can't get away with not weeding for that long of the time and not have some pretty serious consequences, but we've only got a couple weeds to pull out here. If I hadn't have dodged all of those elm seeds, I would have been on my hands and knees here pulling everyone out with my fingers or trying to navigate through these onions with some type of weeding tool. Well, I'd say that's under control and I only allow myself 10 minutes of weeding time per plot per week, so I don't wanna overdo it here. Let's move on to the next one. Our eighth and final strategy is to create a stale seed bed before planting. And that's what we're doing in these two beds of carrots. There will be carrots here shortly, but right now, there are just weeds. What we've done is 
prep our beds with our standard practice, broad forking, topping with compost, tilting for a direct seeded crop like this. And then just turning on the irrigation, I've got some micro sprinklers set up here to do that. And then waiting to see what comes up. Unlike that previous example where I showed you the netting dispersed all of the weeds to the side, all those elm seeds were just falling on these beds. And now we've got elm seeds everywhere and a few other weeds sprinkled in as well. Now I could come across this bed surface with a hoe and cut all these weeds off at the surface they would die, but in the process, if I was stirring up the soil, I would potentially be bringing new weed seeds up to the surface. And now that I've germinated everything on the surface, I'd really like to avoid that. I don't want any new flushes of weeds. So how can I deal with these weeds without disturbing the soil so that I can plant carrots into clean, weed-free beds? For that, we've got two solutions. One solution is to play with a bit of fire. So let's pull out the blowtorch. If we apply just a quick burst of flame over top of the surface here, we can kill these tiny weeds in a split second and save ourselves an immense amount of labor of having to carefully prick out each and every one of these weeds from between our carrots. So here's a quick demo of how this process looks. Now I'm just gonna walk across the surface of the bed quickly watching out for my stuff. So that's one way to end the life of a lot of weeds in a short amount of time with minimal labor. Before we leave the flame weeding subject, I wanna stress that if you're getting into this, the object is not to dwell in one spot and wait until your weeds actually start on fire. The object is to burst their cells quickly. They will die, but still, you can see the, the weeds that I just covered seconds ago with that amazing burst of flame are still green. They're gonna shrivel up and die, but immediately, at the first glance, it looks like they're still alive. That quick burst of flame is very effective in killing such small weeds. If you do have large dandelions emerging from your soil that have a taproot deep below, one burst of flame isn't gonna take them out. So know that this application is really best when you are facing a high density of new weed seeds like we are here in this situation. Now, if I played my cards right here with the flame weeding, I should be able to seed carrots directly here now and have them come up in relatively weed-free soil. I admit part of this strategy is fun. It's kind of fun to pull out the flame every once in a while, but I feel guilty because it's a bit of an excessive use of energy. Is it effective? Yes. Would I go about flame weeding an entire garden plot? Never. Is it worth using in a few specific circumstances when you're direct seeding a high density crop? I'd say yes, and it saves us a ton of time in that scenario. But if you don't have a flame weeder or you don't want to invest in this or you're just plain scared of blowing yourself up, then a more peaceful alternative to this is to simply cover your beds and wait. In these two carrot beds in front of me, I created stale seed beds before planting, but I took a low-tech approach to demonstrate some alternatives. Like the first two beds, I started by prepping the soil completely with broad fork, topping with compost, and loosening the surface with my tilters so that the earthway seeder worked really well here. But I didn't seed the beds immediately. I watered them in really well by hand to make sure the beds were moist, then covered both beds with a sheet of clear plastic. This plastic helped maintain the moisture in the beds and encouraged early germination of any weed seeds that might have found their way to the top a couple of inches. And a black plastic covering would have accomplished that same goal of keeping the moisture in and germinating the weed seeds. But the added value of the clear plastic was that it also boosted the temperature of the soil up to extreme levels. I put a temperature sensor on the surface of the soil to see just how hot it was getting, and it climbed up to 64 degrees Celsius on sunny afternoons, and anything above 60 degrees Celsius is warm enough to kill the majority of weed seeds in a matter of hours, whether they've germinated or not. So I believe I prepped the beds on around May 20th, left the sheet of plastic on for two weeks, came back here on June 5th, 
uncovered the beds and seeded the carrots. Since then I've been maintaining the moisture by hand just to demonstrate a simple technique. I don't need to have automated micro sprinklers here. I could just come out twice a day and make sure I maintain even moisture along the surface of my beds. And now on day eight, I see a beautiful line of carrots in every one of these trenches starting to emerge. And while I love that, what I'm more excited about is that I don't see weeds coming up from those same areas. So these two beds of carrots are just gonna be a pleasure to watch grow and an incredibly low maintenance and productive zone of our garden. Now that I've confirmed germination is looking really good, I'll roll out the drip lines to serve these beds with plenty of moisture for the rest of the season. There are much easier ways, much lower energy methods of suppressing weeds, but whenever I'm tilting the surface of my soil and potentially bringing up new weed seeds before directly seeding a crop at a high density, Carrots is a perfect example. We're going to be wetting the surface during that germination period and the wetting of that bare soil is just quite simply the best starting point for any weed seed as well. So we can't ever expect to plant carrots in that situation and also start with a weed free bed unless we go about using some strategies like this to get rid of the weeds first before planting our carrots. Well, that brings us to the end of our list today. While I would have loved to have told you that there was just one strategy that you could apply everywhere in your garden to win the war on weeds, now I'm sure you can see that there are places for each of these strategies and one solution is not going to solve all of your problems. So where should you start? Well, start by asking these two questions. Which type of crops occupy the majority of your growing space? And which crops are challenging you with the most weed management problems? Then start by applying just a couple of strategies that are going to be most effective for those applications. Intelligent weed management is just one step toward growing a vegetable garden with ease. If you're happy to maintain a couple of small raised beds, pulling weeds by hand, that's totally realistic. But if you're ever going to scale up your vegetable production to feed your family on a year-round basis, you're going to need to work smarter not harder. If you'd like to join me on this path, check out my free workshop where I reveal the three major breakthroughs we've had that enable us to grow a year-round supply of vegetables for our family, even in a cold climate. In that workshop, I'll also share some of the major transformations my students have had from applying the same techniques we talked about here today. You can find a link to that workshop in the description below. That's all for today. See you in the next one.